Well, it is good to be together this evening. Always enjoy family camp. It's fun to see familiar faces. It's also fun to see some new faces. How many people, it's like your first family camp? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's always, it's always fun. That's a fun part of family camp. We get to know each other a little bit better and maybe if you're newer, you get to know some folks. We also get to know, uh, you know, about people's giftedness and um, I learned that uh, Leo has a spiritual gift of barbecue. So <laughs> thank you, my brother. I feel like, you know, however this goes tonight, it's already a win. So everybody's got barbecue in their guts. So we'll leave happy one way or the other. Uh, we're going to start tonight by turning over to Genesis 1. So if you'll turn over there. Genesis 1. We're just going to look at verses 26 through 28 together. Genesis 1, beginning of verse 26. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Let's pray. Lord, we're grateful for this time we have allotted this weekend, some additional time to spend together as a church family uh, in fellowship with one another. Uh, but Lord, additional time to, to come together around your word. We're thankful and we continue to be thankful that you uh, have given us your word, the Bible. Lord, we recognize that the church is a, a creature of the word, that it's uh, your word that created life in the beginning, and Lord, it's your word that causes us to be born again, giving us new spiritual life. The church was given birth by the power of your word. And so, Lord, we thank you for how your word has worked in our lives and how your word continues to work. We are ever dependent on you uh, for every word that proceeds from your mouth. And so, Lord, I pray that as we come to the beginning of camp, that we would uh, come expectant, that we would come uh, with a posture of uh, receptivity uh, to whatever it is you have for us. Lord, I pray that you would illumine our minds, that you would teach us, um, help us to um, come back and revisit uh, perhaps familiar truth, but maybe with fresh eyes. Help us to be um, freshly um, comforted and amazed to think that you've made us in your image. Lord, may we um, humbly submit to you as Holy Spirit, you further conform us to the image of Christ. We ask that you would give us uh, wisdom uh, this week. Um, help us to um, better understand so that we might better obey and live out your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, we are excited, always excited about our time together at uh, family camp. And so, as I'm sure you are aware by now, uh, if nothing else, you're probably holding the t-shirt in your hand. Uh, but we're going to be, we wanted this year to spend some time um, looking at the image of God. And Pastor Jess brought that idea to Pastor Michael and I and said, you know, it'd be kind of cool if we went back and revisited the image of God and thought about, you know, how does that... Um, inform uh, some of the, cult, the current issues that we're dealing with all over the place. Um, maybe said a negative way, um, <laughs> how do we see that so, many, so much of the cultural confusion that's going on around us is because people don't get this doctrine, because people have gone astray from a proper understanding of what it means that humans are made in the image of God. And so we wanted to come back and revisit this uh, familiar doctrine from Scripture. Um, and so tonight, um, I'm going to spend a little bit of time hopefully laying some groundwork 
just to talk about, provide somewhat of a working definition. What, it, what does the Bible mean when it says the image of God? And then from there, Pastor Michael and Pastor Jess and their subsequent messages will spend a little bit of time. There's plenty of issues that we could have tackled this weekend, but there's only so many <laughs> preachers and only so much time. And so we've chosen in particular to deal with what are the implications of the image of God in man for discussions of gender, and what are the implications of the image of God in man for discussions of race, or perhaps better said, ethnicity. Um, so we'll spend some time looking at those things in the, uh, in the remaining session, sessions. But tonight, we're going to begin with, uh, as I said, a bit of a um, consideration of definition. So uh, we begin... Um, if you look at your outline, we'll begin with the importance of definitions. So it's important at the outset that we define our terms, all right, that we give at least somewhat of a working definition of what we mean by the image of God in man. Sadly, we live at a time where people either don't stop to define words or they intentionally redefine them, where words have tended to lose their uh, power have, le- have tended to lose their meaning. People often try to change the definitions of words all the time in order to suit their own purposes and desires. And so we could point to a lot of recent examples of this, but I thought of three. So one, in recent days, we've seen the Biden administration change the definition of a recession right? (laughs) Like, you can just redefine words. If you want to play that game, words don't mean anything. You can just make them mean whatever you want them to mean. And so, the word recession has been redefined such that, no, we're not in a recession. (laughs) I mean, the, the historic standard definition of a recession, by that definition, yes, our country is in a recession. But by the new definition of what a recession means, no, no, we are no longer in a a recession. That's an interesting way to solve problems, right? (laughs) The problem isn't real. It's not there. So we're not in a recession. And what's scary is to see that even online dictionaries have changed the definition, some of them anyway, um, have changed the definition of the word recession, which to me is, you know, pretty scary. The idea that an online dictionary can just, you know, change words and without you even knowing it while you're sleeping, they change the words. You know, maybe maybe print books aren't, aren't such a bad idea after all. So another example we've, we've witnessed in recent years, going a little bit further back, the redefinition of the word marriage, right? The historic, traditional definition of what marriage means, out the window. It's no longer, marriage is no longer defined as a lifelong commitment to, between one man and one woman. It has become much more flexible with our, the changing times of our culture. Or what about the word woman, right? Several of you are probably familiar with Matt Walsh and his recently produced documentary, What is a Woman? And time and again in the documentary, he poses this question, what is a woman? To so-called experts from the left, only to have time and again, to have them utterly fail to provide a cogent definition of the word woman, right? Just like a woman is whoever wants to be a woman, whoever calls themselves a woman. It would actually be comical if it weren't so sad and frightening, right? Apparently anybody can identify as a woman if they want to, regardless of the facts of biology. So these are just a few examples of how um, definitions tend to be fluid in the day in which we live. But we need to fight back against that, right? And we need to define our terms and be clear about what do we mean. Now, underneath each of these examples I've just given, I, you know, I think there is an attempt to, to undertake an even more fundamental redefinition of words. One of the most essential words that has been redefined is the word man. And by man, in this case, I don't mean a biological male necessarily. What I mean is humanity, right? Humanity. What is a human? What is a human, and and we can follow that up with, what is a human for, right? What is the purpose of a human? How you answer that question has massive implications, right? And hopefully you'll see that there's a pretty 
short connection to us having a right understanding of what the image of God means, right? We've got to get man, the doctrine of man, right, or else we're going to very quickly be faced with a whole host of problems. So as I mentioned before, Pastor Michael and Pastor Jess will tease out some of the implications that a biblical definition of man has for discussions of gender and ethnicity. But in order to have a right definition of man, we must have a biblical understanding of, um, you could say, the imago dei, or the image of God in man. So during our time together, we'll explore the meaning of man as God's image. So we move on to our second point. In the beginning, in the beginning, God created all things, including man. By the act of creation, God establishes what we call the creator-creature distinction. God is the creator. We are his creatures. Inherent to this relationship is the fact that he is our rightful king and judge, right? As creator, he has authority over us. We are accountable to him. He is the one whose character defines reality, right? He is the one who has every right to lay burdens and obligations upon us because he's the creator. We are the creature. So inherent to that related relationship of God creating us is the fact that he's our king. He's our judge. But thanks be to God that because of his great love, he's also, you know, the Old Testament calls him our savior, or in other places, our shepherd, or elsewhere, our husband, or elsewhere, our father. So God relates to us by grace. Now, when God created humanity, we just read it a moment ago in Genesis 1. The Genesis account tells us that he made us, quote, in his image, in Genesis 1, 26 and 27. So man is created in God's image. And the Bible tells us that man is still in God's image even after the fall. So we turn over a few chapters to Genesis 9, verse 6. This is following the flood, and God uh, does kind of an act of uh, recreation, right? He in the original creation, he separated the flood waters. He caused the dry land to come forth. And then with the flood, he like decreated and then he redoes it. And Adam, uh, Noah is a sort of second Adam. But God gives human government to Noah. And we see the basis for the death penalty in the Old Testament. Genesis 9, 6, the Lord says to Noah, whoever sheds man's blood by man, his blood shall be shed. Why? For in the image of God, he made man. So the implication there is that even after the fall, right, even after Genesis 3, people still bear the image of God. To murder a human being is an assault on God himself as mankind bears his image. And so the Bible teaches that man remains in the image of God even after the fall. You can see also James 3 9, a discussion of the tongue, and it talks about how, huh, how backwards it is that we use our tongues to bless God, and yet in the same breath we use our tongues to curse man who was made in his likeness. So, again, just a reaffirmation that people are still bear the image and likeness of God. And so, when people say that the image of God was completely lost or destroyed in the fall, that goes against the biblical witness. The man is still in the image of God. So we go on to our next point. The imago Dei, or image of God, representation and reflection. Now, there's been no small amount of discussion in the history of the church about what it means that man is in the image of of God. Time won't permit for me to survey the landscape of all the various views that have been held regarding the Imago Dei. Karl Barth presents a survey of various views in the third volume of his Church Dogmatics. So that's kind of like a quick, you know, well maybe not quick, but a summary of some of the various views. 
Some of the resources I used in preparation for this talk um, outline these various views. So if you're interested, I can point you in the direction of where you might check those out. Um, but for time's sake, I'm not going to go into that here. Um, all the various possible views, I'm just going to develop the one that I think is correct. So while I won't cover all the various options of the meaning of the Imago Dei, there are some important points I want to consider here. One point under discussion is whether the image is to be conceived of in spiritual or physical characteristics. So many people have held that the image of God is to be thought of in terms of spiritual qualities or attributes. So some have said uh, the image of God in man is the soul or the image of God in man is reason, rationality. These are a couple of examples of the kind of spiritual qualities or characteristics that people have said. Maybe the, the, the image of God is this. Others have held that the image includes physical characteristics as well. And I'm of the persuasion that the image of God speaks to both the immaterial and material aspects in man. So the image of God refers to the whole person, physical and non-physical, material and immaterial. Now I think the reason that many people have shied away from seeing any physical aspect to the image of God is that God is incorpor incorporeal. I can't say that word even. He doesn't have a body, is what I mean to say, right? God, the Bible clearly teaches, is spirit. So the divine nature doesn't have a physical body. Now, it'd be wrong for us to think that we as physical creatures are in the image of God because God has a physical form. So God has a physical form and therefore we have a physical form. That would be wrong, right? That would be, um, depending on what you mean by that, it would be heretical um, to say that God has a body, given that God is spirit. But I think this is where the confusion begins. I think where confusion happens is the assumption that God himself possesses the image of God. God does not possess the image of God, is what I'm going to argue. The image and likeness of God means that we are in some way similar to him, but it does not mean that he himself possesses that image. Peter Gentry explains in this view that, quote, the statement that man is created in the image of God means that man conforms to a representation of God. Gentry goes on to quote Gordon Winham, who says, man is made in the divine image, just as the tabernacle was made in the divine pattern. This suggests that man is a copy of something that had the divine image, not necessarily a copy of God himself. Now, Wynnum is here alluding to Hebrews 8, which says that the tabernacle was patterned after the heavenly dwelling place of God. So if you want to write down a couple of references, Hebrews uh, 8, verses 5 and 6, and Hebrews 9, 23 to 24, the writer of Hebrews there, in talking about the tabernacle, says that the tabernacle is merely an earthly copy of the heavenly reality, of the heavenly tabernacle. So this isn't the real tabernacle, this is a copy of of the one in heaven. And so like Wynnum is saying, it's like there's a pattern that bears the image of God and human beings are created after that pattern. But Wynnum says it's a copy of something that had the divine image, but not necessarily a copy of God himself. So the image of God is a divine pattern and that it's conceived of in the mind of God but it is not something that the, the divine nature himself possesses. The divine image is the archetypal pattern of what humanity is supposed to be conceived of in the mind of God. So in the mind of God, he has this definition for human. Humanity equals the image of God. This is the pattern. And to say that people are in the image of God is to say that they conform to that pattern which God is conceived of, which in some ways, to be sure, is like God, in some ways represents him, but God himself doesn't have that image, if that makes sense to you. So 
the image of God is comprised of both material and immaterial aspects because man, which is the image of God, is by definition a physical and spiritual being. Now, while the Old Testament differentiates between the physical and the spiritual, it sees no sharp divide between man's body and his soul, such that it would say man's spirit is in the image of God, but not his body. So the image of God is just spiritual, it's not physical. So, so man's spirit is in the image of God, but not his body. No, the Old Testament sees the human being as a unity of soul and body. It's only later Platonism that makes a sharp divide between the soul and body. The Lord values the human body just as he values the human soul. He created the divine image to be a unity of body and soul. And we will ultimately, in the resurrection, inhabit a renewed physical creation in a bodily existence. It's important that we understand that man's physicality is included in the divine image. That's really what I'm trying to get at here. As we'll see, the word for image, the Hebrew word selim, typically has physical objects in view. So if we think about what the divine image means in terms of qualities and attributes, we should include both the spiritual and the physical aspects of man. However, I don't think that the image of God in man is primarily intended to describe the attributes of humans. And that's the way that it gets talked about a lot of times whenever people talk about the image of God is they begin to enumerate, well, it means rationality, it means love, and they start like enumerating things. Like, yeah, these are attributes of God, so I see how you're getting at that. Um, but it, it seems somewhat arbitrary to me. In those ac accountings of the image of God in man, I never find myself fully convinced. I'm like, I, yeah, like that kind of makes sense, but it kind of seems like you're just making that up. Um, so I don't think, now certainly the Bible, does the Bible teach that humanity is loving because God is loving? Yeah, sure, it teaches all those things. But what I'm saying is that when the Bible talks about the image of God, it's not meaning to talk about that primarily. It's not meaning to talk primarily about attributes or some kind of um, characteristics or qualities. I think that when the Bible talks about the image of God in man, it points primarily to the function of human beings. So it's not talking primarily about what various attributes that human beings possess, the image of God doctrine. It's primary focus is about the function of human beings. In other words, what is the purpose? What is the telos of human beings? What were we made to do? Now, let me be quick to clarify because there could be some confusion about that point that I just said. By saying that the image of God is comprised primarily in terms of function, in other words, what humans do or are intended to do, I'm not saying that a person ceases to possess the image of God if they fail to perform certain functions or abilities. In other words, if humanity's function is to reflect God, do we cease to possess the image of God when we fail to reflect him, when we fail to fulfill that function? Was Adam no longer in God's image after the fall because he failed to fulfill the function of reflecting God? No, of course not. Right? We just saw that the Bible teaches that Adam was still in the image of God even after he sinned. The image of God is essential to every human being and can in no way be removed. Every person is in the image of God, even if many fail to fulfill the function of reflecting him. Also, don't hear the, this functional argument that I'm making as being in some way, if I can use the current vernacular, as being in some way ableist. It, in other words, um, are, are the unborn or the handicapped or the elderly less in the image of God because they can't perform certain functions? Of course not, right? Of course not. The image of God is essential to every human being. Every person is equally in the image of God. So sometimes people re react negatively to this function kind of language, and I think it's because that's what they're hearing, but that's not what I'm saying. So I want to be careful to affirm those things, that every person, regardless of their abilities, 
is equally in the image of God. The point of the functional argument is to say that the Imago Dei doctrine is intended to communicate not primarily about the ontology or physical attributes of human beings, but rather about the purpose for which people were made. The doctrine of the image of God is primarily intended to communicate what a human is for, not what a human is made up of or what they're like, but what are they for? That's what I think the Imago Dei is really driving at. It points us to the telos, or the purpose, the end goal for which humanity was created. If man was created for a particular purpose, that has significant implications on the way that we handle discussions of gender, on the way that we handle discussions of ethnicity, or whatever other topic we're talking about, right? If God created us for to fulfill a certain function, if he created us for a certain purpose, then that affects everything, right? Everything that we talk about. The image of God doctrine tells us that the telos of humanity is this, and it's summed up in those two words we used at the beginning, representation and reflection. You see, we reflect him by being made in his likeness, and we represent him by exercising dominion over creation. We see this in verses 26 and 28 of Genesis 1. So in the remaining points, we'll further unpack what it means for humanity to represent and reflect God. So we're going to spend a lot of time in this next point. So we're going to be coming close to the end of our time. You're like, oh my goodness, he's still on his fourth point. We're going to camp out here for a while, okay? We're going to consider the cultural and canonical context in which Genesis 1 is written. So in order to understand the image of God that's talked about in Genesis 1, I think we need to consider context, cultural context, canonical context. The word for image that is used in Genesis 1, we said it before, but it's tselem, T-S-E-L-E-M, tselem. David Kleins explains, quote, Salem and its cognates in other Semitic languages are used predominantly in a literal sense of three-dimensional objects that represent gods, humans, or other living beings, end quote. And this is the way that it's used also primarily in the Bible. If we look at each of the occurrences of the word Salem in the Hebrew Bible, we see that this word translated image is most often used, interestingly, in reference to idols. So I'll quickly list, these are all the occurrences of this word in the Hebrew Bible. The word salem, or image, occurs 17 times in the Hebrew Bible in 15 verses. And it almost always refers to a physical object that represents something else. In Numbers 3352, if you don't get all these references down and you want to look them up later, I can give them to you again and in a side conversation. But I'll just say the reference and give you a quick summary of what it's talking about there. Numbers 3352, there is a command to destroy Canaanite molten images, right? So statues, physical images. In 1 Samuel 6, Verses 5 and 11, the word is used in both those verses, and it talks there about the likenesses of the Philistine tumors. This is after the Ark of God was captured, and the Philistines began to be cursed, and they're like, let's get this thing out of here. So they try to like atone, and they send it back, but when they send it back, they make these weird likenesses, images of the tumors that they had gotten from the plague God struck them with. But again, there it's a physical representation of the tumors that they were struck with. 2 Kings 11.18 talks about the images of Baal and the house of Baal. So that's the way that it's commonly used. An image refers to an idol. In this case, a statue that's intended, a physical statue that's intended to represent the god Baal. In Psalm 39.6, it says, every man walks about as a phantom. Now this is the one usage of this word in the Hebrew Old Testament that... Um, almost certainly refers to a non-physical usage, right? So every man walks about as an image, but it's like the image of a ghost, right? It walks about as a phantom. So this is the one definitely non-physical use of this word. It's in Psalm 39.6. In Psalm 30, uh, sorry, 73.20, it says, the form of the wicked man 
Um, you know, it says that God despises the form, literally the image of the wicked man. So that's possibly a non-physical usage, though I don't, I think that would be a weird thing to parse out. Like the wicked man is a body with a soul. So I think it probably at least includes a physical body, but the Lord will despise the form, the image of the wicked man. In Ezekiel 7.20, it talks about images of abominations placed within the temple. So again, this is the way the word is most often used, is of a statue of a, an idol placed in a pagan temple. Ezekiel 16, 17 talks about idolatrous male images. So images that are likened to men, but that people were um, worshiping. Ezekiel 23, 14 talks about obscene images of Chaldeans that were displayed on the wall. So here it's a, a likeness of men, right? A physical representation on the wall. So in this case, probably a 2D image rather than a 3D figure, but a 2D image of Chaldean warriors, soldiers displayed on a wall. So it's a physical representation of Chaldean soldiers. In Amos 5:26 talks about images of false gods. There again, it's idols, right? And the last, well, the last in this list is 2 Chronicles 23, 17, where it talks again about images of Baal and the house of Baal. So talking about statues of wood or stone. Now, the only remaining occurrences of this word, Salem, in the Hebrew Bible are found in Genesis 1, our text, where it says that man is in the Salem of God, over in Genesis 5, where in the one occurrence, it reaffirms that man is in the image of God, but then it goes on to say that, um, you know, Adam beget a son in his own image and likeness, Seth. So, of course, Seth had a physical body in some sense. He was a physical representation of his dad in the same way that Joel is a physical representation of Pastor Jess. And then in Genesis 9, which we just looked at, where it says, if you shed man's blood, your blood will be shed. Why? Because man is in the image of God. So the other occurrences of this word are the point of this debate, right? Genesis 1 and 9. How's it being used there? But everywhere else, with the exception of Psalm 39, 6, it's talking about a physical object that represents something else, a God or a human or something else. So I would say that the word salem seems to point to the fact that humanity is a physical representation of God. Certainly that includes that we are a, an ensouled body, so we have a soul, we have a spirit, but we are a physical representation of God. Of course, not that humanity is itself God or in any way divine, but rather that humanity is a divine representative. Now, whereas kings, ancient kings, or kings in the ancient Near East, or false gods would set up statues to represent their presence, the true and living God has installed human beings to be his image, his physical representatives on earth. The Lord doesn't set up dumb idols made of wood and stone, but instead living and breathing human souls to be his image. Listen to how David Kleins describes the nature of images in the ancient Near East. He says, quote, The king puts his statue in a conquered land to signify... Uh, there, he's talking about images, Salem, right? The king puts his statue in a conquered land to signify his real, though not his physical, presence there. The god has his statue set up in the temple to signify his real presence there though he may be in heaven on the mountain of the gods or located in some natural phenomenon and so not physically present in the temple. According to Genesis 1, 26 and 27, humanity is set on earth in order to be the representative there of the absent God who is nevertheless present by his image, end quote. So whenever false gods were worshiped, statues were set up in the territories that they supposedly ruled over, governed, or in the temples of those false gods in order to represent their presence among their worshipers. Not only that, kings were often thought to be the representatives of false gods. So you think about maybe like Pharaoh or something like that who is himself thought to be divine. 
We see that even later in history where you see like Antiochus Epiphanes during the intertestamental period thinks he's like a manifestation of the divine, of the gods. So in the ancient Near East, sometimes people thought that the king was a physical representation of the gods that they worshipped. In fact, kings were often referred to as the image of God. Peter Gentry provides a few noteworthy quotes from texts that were written around 1000 to 600 BC, where the king is referred to as the image of God, the exact phrase that we find in Genesis 1. So in one instance, it says, as to what the king my lord wrote me, from the lips of my father I have heard that you are a loyal family, but now I know it, I have seen it. The father of my king, my lord, was the very image of Bel, and the king, my lord, is likewise the very image, Selim, of Bel. In another case, why should not a meal be served before the king, my lord, a second time today? Whoever mourns for Shamash, the king of the gods, mourns for a day, a whole night, and again two days. The king, the lord of the countries, is the very image of Shamash. For half a day only should he put on mourning. And in one last example, O king, thou art the image of Marduk, when thou art angry to thy servants. When we draw near the king our lord, we shall see his peace. So these couple of ancient texts illustrate that in the ancient Near East, the king was thought to be the very image of God. And I believe that this illuminates what Genesis 1 is telling us about not only Adam as the first man, but about all human beings. Humanity, corporately and individually, is the image of God, his physical representation on the earth. Humans are created to represent God by reflecting his glory and by ruling as his vice regents. Notice that Adam was a king. Adam was a king and the very image of God. Genesis 1.26, Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion. Some commentators note that the structure of the Hebrew here should be translated with the sense, Let us make man in our image so that they will have dominion. So a key part of humanity being made in God's image is that we would exercise dominion as God's representatives. That Adam as a sort of king was the physical representation of Yahweh, the true and living God. Now, while we don't have time to unpack all that dominion means, we can at least say it means that we are to govern ourselves and God's world as God's representatives in accordance with God's law, right? So while we won't spell out everything, it means that what it looks like to exercise dominion, it means that, right? In the ancient Near Eastern context, the king alone was thought to be in God's image. So the king has a special status as the very image of God. But in Genesis 1, all human beings are said to be God's image. Adam was a king, and so too are all of the descendants of Adam. You see, humanity was meant to reign with God over his good world. As when we come to the end of the biblical storyline, we see that his saints will reign with him, right? We will reign with Christ in a new heavens and a new earth. The purpose for humanity that God had from the very beginning, that we would reign as kings and queens, if we want to gender the language, as kings and queens reigning with him. That not only the king, but uh, that all people are made in the image of God, as you can imagine, has a radical democratizing effect, right? It's not just, you know, where like the Pharaoh would say, hey, you guys better do what I say or else I'm going to make the sun not come up tomorrow. Okay. Um, But this is saying, everybody, right, regardless of class or whatever else, is the image of God, is given the dominion mandate, right? 
So whereas in other ancient Near Eastern cultures, the king alone was thought to be in the image of God, Genesis 1 combats that by saying, no, all people are, in a sense, kings and bear the image of God. Now that man is made in the image of God also provides an interesting solution to, there's a, a tension between God's transcendence and his imminence, right? By God's transcendence, we mean that God is separate. He's high and lifted up, right? He is separate from his creation. He's not a part of his creation. He's above it. But that he is imminent means that he is near to and lovingly involved with his creation, his transcendence means that his abode is in the highest heavens. But through humanity as his image, he is imminent in creation. So it's an interesting solution to this idea that God is both transcendent and imminent. That certainly we see, um, we'll talk about this briefly later, but where God walks with Adam and Eve in the garden in the cool of the day. So God is present with them. He's actually there. But the way the Bible talks about God, his abode is in heaven, right? So it's like, yeah, he walks in the garden, at least for that period of time, but heaven is above. It's the highest heavens. So how is the transcendent God who lives way up there present all the time in creation by his image, who is his physical representation on the earth? Klein says, quote, It is of the greatest theological moment, therefore, that precisely within this description of God's transcendent freedom over the whole world order, we find the concept of God's image, that is to say, of the real presence or eminence of the deity within the world through the person of humans, end quote. Now, I know that we've covered a lot of ground and we've still got a lot more to cover, but... Um, let's pause here for a moment because I think Klein's provides a helpful summary that it's pretty much sums up and agrees with all that we've said up to this point. So here's a bit of an extended quote, but listen to what Klein says by way of summary of the ground we've covered so far. In summary, the concept of the image of God may be formulated thus. Humankind is created not in God's image since God has no image of his own, but as God's image. I don't exactly agree with him there. We won't get into all the reasons why. I still think we're made in the image of God, but anyway, nonetheless, I agree with the fact that God does not bear this image of his own, but we are created as God's image, or rather, to be God's image. That is, to deputize in the created world for the transcendent God who remains outside the world order. That humanity is God's image means that it is the visible corporeal representative of the invisible bodiless God. Humanity is representative rather than representation since the idea of portrayal is secondary in the significance of the image. However, the term likeness is an assurance that humanity is an adequate and faithful representative of God on earth. The whole person is the image of God without distinction of spirit and body. All humankind, without distinction, are the image of God. The image is to be understood not so much ontologically as existentially. It comes to expression not in the nature of humanity so much as in its activity and function. This function is to represent God's lordship to the lower orders of creation. The dominion of humanity over creation can hardly be excluded from the context of the image itself. Humankind, which means both the human race and individual persons, does not cease to be the image of God so long as it remains human. To be human and to be the image of God are not separable." End quote. So, as God's image, Adam is to function as a king. This idea of representation. But not only that, Adam is also to function as a kind of priest. And in order to see that, we need to recognize that the Garden of Eden was a temple sanctuary. Now, whenever we hear priests, we think, you know, propitiatory sacrifices. Now, when Adam was first created, that wasn't necessary because there wasn't sin, right? 
But it's analogous to how now we as Christians, we bring sacrifices to our Lord, right? Well, does that mean that we're bringing sacrifices to atone for our sins? Of course not, right? Jesus made the one, one and, once and for all propitiatory sacrifice for us. So we are called a kingdom of priests and we bring sacrifices to the Lord. But of course, we're not bringing sacrifices to make atonement for sin. Rather, it's as worship, as thanksgiving. So that's analogous to what I would say Adam was called to do in his role as a priest. Not to make propitiation, because there wasn't even sin yet, but still to um, serve in a priestly function nonetheless. So Adam is to function as a kind of priest. And in order to see this, we need to recognize that the Garden of Eden was a temple sanctuary. Now, I'll just do the 30,000 foot view from Genesis to Revelation of this theme of the temple, right? The first expression of the temple is, so what is the purpose of the temple? It's the place where God dwells with his people, right? So the first expression of that is in Eden, where God walks with Adam and Eve in the garden in the cool of the day. And that gets all messed up when they sin because then God sends them out of his presence. So the garden's a temple God's presence dwells there in the midst of his people, but he sends them out of his presence when sin enters the picture. Nevertheless, God makes plans by his grace to further, to reestablish his presence among his people, even in spite of their sins, by making atonement for their sins, such that he might remove the barrier of sin, right? And I think we see a glimpse of this, even with the killing of animals to clothe their nakedness and their shame. I think that's kind of like a, proto um, version of animal sacrifice but still Adam and Eve are sent out of the presence of God in the garden but we go forward in Genesis and we see various theophanies where God comes near to his people one of the most potent of those we looked at recently is Genesis 28 Jacob's ladder where surely the Lord is in this place and I didn't even know it right and God is there talking face to face with Jacob so it's kind of a picture of the temple. But where this really gets codified is after the Exodus and with Moses, where God instructs Moses to build the tabernacle, right? And that is the place where God dwells in the midst of sinful people. And you have the mercy seat, right? The presence of a holy God meets in the midst of a sinful camp where he meets them at the mercy seat, where propitiation is made, right? So you have the tabernacle, and then fast forward to Solomon's time, and you have the temple, which is just a bigger, better version of the tabernacle, right? But as Adam and Eve were exiled from the Garden of Eden, so too the nation of Israel is exiled from the Promised Land and the Babylonian captivity, and the Jerusalem temple is destroyed, such that the presence of God is once again removed from them. Nevertheless, God promises that there is coming a future temple. And you see an extensive treatment of this in Ezekiel in chapters 40 through 48, where he envisions this glorious eschatological temple. And so there's an anticipation that God will once again dwell in the midst of his people. And all of that is typological for what we find with the coming of Christ in the New Testament, where Jesus, in his incarnation, he becomes the true tabernacle. John 1.14 says the word of God became flesh and tabernacled among us. In John uh, 2, verses 19 to 21, Jesus says, destroy this temple and I'll raise it up in three days. And they think he's talking about Herod's rebuilt temple, but later they understood that Jesus was talking about the temple of his body, right? So the temple, the place where God dwells with man is, the, is in the incarnation. Following the ascension of Christ, the church is said to be the temple of the living God as we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And this all anticipates a day when Jesus returns, when the new heavens and earth will be established, when the new Jerusalem will come down out of the sky. In Revelation 21, verse 22, you're, you're seeing all this Genesis language, right? You're like, this sounds like Eden. But it says in Revelation 21, 22, that there will be no need for a temple because the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple, right? So that's like a 30,000 foot view of this idea of the temple. But it begins with God dwelling in the midst of his people in Eden, 
The garden is a garden temple. And hopefully as you think about the garden in relationship to the rest of the canon, like we just did, you're like, oh yeah, I get it. I, I see how that is. I see how that's a temple. So now that we briefly surveyed the sweep of the temple theme from Genesis to Revelation, let's go back and further unpack how Eden was a temple. When we look at the description of the tabernacle and the temple, we notice that it was patterned after the Garden of Eden. Many have done work on this, but just one person who I engaged with was Alan Ross. Ross points out several features of the tabernacle and the temple that are patterned after Eden. So I'll list some of them here. One, we see that life-giving uh, life water flows out from the midst of Eden, where it talks about a river that's coming out of the midst of the garden, right? And as you get further descriptions of the temple in the, in the Old Testament, like in Psalm 46, the psalm that we love to sing by Shane and Shane, it talks about how there's a river of God that makes glad the people of God. So the dwelling place of God is pictured as being right by a, um, a river of living water, life-giving water. Or you think about Ezekiel in that temple vision, you see like, Somebody forgot to turn the sink off because all this water is flowing out from under the doors of the temple and over the threshold and it's filling the entire land, right? And it's not waters of judgment like Noah's Ark, but instead it's life-giving waters that the ground is dry and thirsty and it's a wilderness, it's a waste place, and this life-giving water flows out from the temple and it revives the land, right? So you have descriptions. And then, of course, when we fast forward to Revelation, what do you find in the New Jerusalem? You find there's a river there, a life-giving river, right? So um, you often have living water, life-giving water associated with the temple. Two, the gold and precious gems that were present in Eden were later used to furnish the temple and for the priestly garments. So if you look at Genesis 2, 11 through 12, it talks about, you know, gold, precious stones, things like this, but you have those revisited in the construction of the tabernacle, right? In the, um, it's decorative for the um, furnishings of the tabernacle. It's also, you have these 12 stones in the breastplate of the high priest, right? And even later, again, in Revelation, you get it talking about like precious stones and gold and stuff like this. Um, again, it's, it's temple stuff, and it goes back to yeah, that's the, that's the technical theological term for it. Temple stuff. Um, three, the tree of life in the middle of the garden, Genesis 2.9, is depicted in the tabernacle by the golden lampstand that's in the middle of the tabernacle. So just as there's a tree of life in the midst of the garden, there is a um, golden lampstand in the midst of the tabernacle. Ross explains, quote, in the first room was the lampstand made of solid gold in the form of one central shaft with six branches decorated with cups and almond blossoms, a stylized tree recalling the tree of life in the garden. You can see descriptions of the uh, golden lampstand in Exodus 25 and in Exodus 37. Notice also, if you look at those passages, that the Lord commands that the lamps shall be seven in number, right? So... You hear seven and you're thinking about what? The time of creation, right? Um, and so the lamps on the lampstand are to be seven in number, recalling Eden. Um, fourth, the task given to Adam in the garden is the same task that's later given to the Levites. Now again, not in terms of making sacrifices of atonement, but as far as having a priestly function Adam was commanded by God in Genesis 2.15 to cultivate. The word there is avad. It's the word that is uh, most often translated to serve, like a servant. But he is to cultivate avad, the garden, and to keep shamar it. Uh, shamar is often translated protect. But there it's to cultivate and to keep the garden. Ross explains that the only other places in Scripture, in the Old Testament, where these two verbs are found as a pair like this, to cultivate and to keep, are in reference to the duties of the Levites with respect to the sanctuary. So you have a few different passages where it talks about the role of the Levites, and they are to avod 
and to shamar. So it, it might be translated differently with a different English word, but the Hebrew words behind it are these words that are translated cultivate and keep in, in uh, Genesis 2. So the obligations that were laid upon Adam in the temple sanctuary are laid upon the Levitical priests in the tabernacle. And fifth, this is the last one that I'm going to look at, but as the cherubim guarded, and this is interesting because the word that's used, the command that's given to Adam in Genesis 2.15, it says he is to keep, to shamar, to protect or to guard the garden. Um, whenever he fails in his priestly role, he's exiled from the garden and he's replaced by the cherubim who are tasked with shamar, with keeping, protecting the garden. So these guardians of the presence and the holiness of God um, function in the way that Adam had failed to. But you see cherubim, that is plural, angels, stationed with a sword to guard the way to the tree of life. So you see cherubim present at the entrance to the Garden of Eden, and where else do you see them? You see them in the tabernacle, seated on the mercy seat. There are two cherubim associated with and guarding the presence of the Lord. The cherubim are seated above the mercy seat. And so these are just some examples of parallels you see where the later tabernacle is patterned after what we find in Eden. That is to say a garden temple. Eden was the place where God dwelt with humanity. And more than that, Eden was the place where God dwelt on earth through the agency of humanity, who is the image of God. Ross says this, quote, All ancient temples and sanctuaries had images of the deities that had dominion over them. Likewise, the garden sanctuary of the Lord had images, but they were very different from what the pagan world later developed. These images were made by God, not by people. For humans themselves were the image of God, living, breathing, thinking human beings. The image of God describes living human beings with spiritual and intellectual capacities, not carvings made of stone or wood, end quote. Gentry summarizes the function of humanity as God's image nicely when he says, Thus Genesis 2, 8 through 17 pictures Adam as a kind of king priest worshiping in a garden sanctuary. So to sum up, having considered the cultural and canonical context of Genesis 1, I've argued that mankind has been created as God's image. As God's image Mankind was installed in the garden temple to image God's glory in the world as his physical representatives and to rule in accordance with his word as his kingly image. Now, with the remaining time we have, which is not much, but I told you we'd spend a lot of time there. With the remaining time we have, let's consider how mankind reflects God as his image. We move on to point five. We resemble what we revere. In his book, We Become What We Worship, Greg Beale explores some of the implications of the fact that we have been created as the image of God. He says, in Genesis 1, God created humans, humans to be imaging beings who reflect his glory. God has made humans to reflect him. But if they do not commit themselves to him, they will not reflect him but something else in creation. At the core of our beings, we are imaging creatures. It is not possible to be neutral on this issue. We either reflect the creator or something in creation, end quote. Commenting on the fact that we are created to image God, Richard Lentz says, a mirror reflects. A distorted or broken mirror also reflects but in a distorted or broken fashion. All people, by virtue of how God created us, he created us to be imaging beings. But either we image as we ought to, the image of the living God, or else we're distorted, broken. And we present, we reflect distorted images found in idolatry. As creatures who are created to image, 
we will necessarily reflect what we behold in worship. Hence the title of Beale's book, We Become What We Worship. The thesis of Beale's book is this, what people revere, they resemble, either for ruin or restoration. What people revere, they resemble, either for ruin or restoration. Let's spend a moment examining what happens when we worship idols versus when we worship the true and living God as we were created to do. We see the problem of idolatry. We are intended to image God, the one who has made us in his image. God created us as his image such that we would reflect his glory back to him and out into creation. We are imaging creatures. God's glory shines upon us such that we would reflect his glory back to him and reflect it outward to creation. But instead, we try to usurp the creator by making our own images, idols, that reflect our glory. But in an ironic twist, we are judged for our idolatry as we end up reflecting the idols that we worship, right? We are imaging creatures. We can't help but image. And we try to usurp the cre creator and become our own little gods and make idols that we've fashioned by our hands such that they will bring glory to us. But instead, we end up imaging our idols and becoming like them. Turn with me over to Psalm 115, verses 1 through 8. Psalm 115, beginning of verse 1. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory, because of your loving kindness, because of your truth. Why should the nation say, where now is their God? But our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of man's hands. They have mouths, but they cannot speak. They have eyes, but they cannot see. They have ears, but they cannot hear. They have noses, but they cannot smell. They have hands, but they cannot feel. They have feet, but they cannot walk. They cannot make a sound with their throat. Those who make them will become like them, everyone who trusts in them. And we see this radically illustrated if we turn over to the prophets to that all familiar chapter, chapter in Isaiah 6, right? This is one of the mega chapters of the Bible. It stands tall in the Old Testament and it stands tall even in the New Testament as it's quoted time and again. It's quoted by Jesus. It's quoted by the Apostle Paul in some crucial places. But there you have the appearance of the Lord lofty and seated on his throne um, after the death of King Uzziah. And this is the, the commissioning of Isaiah. But God says, who will I send and who will go for us? So he sends Isaiah out as his messenger. And it says in verse 9, he said, go and tell this people, keep on listening, but do not perceive. Keep on looking, but do not understand. Render the hearts of this people insensitive, their ears dull, their eyes dim. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and return and be healed. As you study Isaiah's prophecy, the theme of idolatry comes up time and time again. But just as you saw in 115, how the idols have eyes but don't see. They have ears but don't hear, right? They're dumb. They can't speak. Those who worship them will become like them. And you see that happening in Isaiah 6, right? They can't receive the word of God, which causes dead men to live. Why? Because they're like the idols that they worship. They've become like dumb idols. Dumb idols have eyes but can't see, ears but can't hear. And those who worship them become like them. As imaging creatures, sinners end up imaging their idols. We become what we worship. If you look at Isaiah 1, 28 through 31, for the sake of time, we won't read through it, but you can look it up later. Isaiah 1, 28 through 31. There again, early in Isaiah's prophecy, is the context of idolatry. And it talks about how the people worshiped oaks, right? It's talking about their worshiping of idols. But it says that God's judgment will come and then it will burn up the oaks. But then it says, 
that the people will be burned up with their, the idols that they've worshipped. So God is going to burn up these trees, but those who revere, those who worship them, will also be burned up with them in an act of judgment. Those who worship them will become like them, right? Not only in the sense that they will bear some of the same qualities and characteristics, but in the sense that they will face the same judgment, right? In this case, they'll be burned up just like their idols. In Exodus 32, this is one that's worth turning over to. Can anybody tell me off the top of your head what's happening in Exodus 32? Golden calf, yep. In Exodus 32, Aaron leads the people in making a golden calf. And the people say, behold, our God who brought us up out of Egypt. And the people begin worshiping in a gross way, is what I'll say. <laughs> Since we have many, many different ears present in the room. Um, but they worship a golden calf. But what ends up happening as a result? Israel, who worships a, a golden calf, becomes like the calf that they worshiped. Look at verses 8 and 9 of Exodus 32. They have quickly turned aside from the way which I commanded them. They have made for themselves a molten calf and have worshipped it and have sacrificed to it and said, This is your God, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. The Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people. Behold, they are an obstinate people. It says they're a stiff-necked people. What are they like? They're like calves, right? They have a big, stiff, strong neck that, you know, it's like bows up against its master, right? If you look down further in verse 25, now when Moses saw that the people were out of control, for Aaron had let them get out of control to be a derision among their enemies, then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, whoever is for the Lord come to me, and all the sons of, Israel, of Levi gathered to him. Out of control is a calf breaking out of its pen, is the picture of a wild animal that's broken loose. These people with their debased, desires are like wild animals who have broken loose and are running around. We become what we worship. You worship a golden calf, you imaging creatures are like the idols you worship. You have stiff necks, you're out of control, you've broken out of your pen, right? We resemble what we revere, in this case, for ruin. So because humans are imaging creatures, idolaters are stiff-necked, out of control, spiritually blind and deaf, and will ultimately succumb to the same fate as their idols, as we become what we worship. We can see this principle of imaging in that we become like the people we associate ourselves with, right? Bad company corrupts good morals. Why? Because we're imaging creatures, right? Whenever we even have a conversation you mirror the person who's right there in front of you, right? You tend to copy their expressions. Why? Because you're an imaging creature. That's what you were made to do. So we see this principle that we are images of God in that we become like the people we surround ourselves with. We also see this illustrated in that people who are characterized by certain besetting sins are transformed by those sins. Just look at the physical appearance of someone who is deeply in bondage to their idols and addictions, right? Have you ever seen the face of somebody who's on meth, right? Like people's, what people idolize, they resemble, they resemble what they revere, right? People come to embody the idols that they worship. So since we become what we worship, we must exercise great care in what we behold. If we revere idols, we will resemble them for our ruin. But now we come to our last point, and we'll see the positive side of the fact that we become what we worship, our restoration in Christ. If we look at the broad sweep of redemptive history, we can summarize it like this. Mankind was created as God's image to reflect his glory, but man fell into idolatry and became like the idols he worshiped. However, God sent forth his son, the true image of God, to bring about our restoration. We can say that humanity, I would say that humanity is both in the image of God and is the image of God. 1 Corinthians eleven seven, for instance, affirms that man is the image of and glory of God. 
you look at 1 Corinthians 11, 7, it doesn't say man is in the image of God. It says man is the image and glory of God. So there is a relationship of equation. The image of God is equated with humanity itself. The image of God equals humanity. Yet more frequently, the Bible affirms that man is in the image of God, which suggests that man is patterned after something. See, for instance, James 3, 9, like we talked about earlier, that man is in the likeness of God. When we come to the New Testament, we discover that the true image of God is Jesus. 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, Colossians 1.15, both affirm that Jesus is the image of God. Not Jesus is in the image of God. That's never said about Jesus. Jesus is the image of God. We are in the image of God, not because the divine nature possesses the image of God, since it doesn't, but because we are patterned after the archetypal human, namely the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the true image of God. Jesus is the image of God, and in that sense, humanity is the image of God. But individual humans, us, are in the image of God because we're created after that pattern, namely Jesus, who is the archetype of what a human being is supposed to be. Whenever we read the New Testament, we have, we're quick to affirm, and we should, that Jesus is fully God, right? And the New Testament clearly teaches that. But Jesus is fully human. And the way that we think about that in his incarnation is like, Jesus was patterned after Adam. And that's right insofar as it goes in his incarnation. But understand that ultimately, Adam was patterned after Jesus. Every human being is patterned after Jesus. And Jesus, in his resurrection body, is the picture of what humanity was always meant to be and what it will be, right, for those who trust in him. So Jesus is the image of God whom we are patterned after. You see, the transcendent God is eminent in creation in the incarnation of Jesus. As the image of God, Jesus is the true priest king of which Adam in the garden was only a type. As God's image, Jesus images God's glory back to him and outward into creation. You see, we image God's glory as the moon reflects the sun. But Jesus is the glory of God. He is the sun, S-U-N, itself, right? The glory of God emanates from him. He possesses the glory of God because he is God. Therefore, in his incarnation, we have beheld the glory of God, John 1, 14 says. The glory of God shines forth from Jesus. We have beheld his glory. And all who have been saved by the death and resurrection of Jesus are now being conformed to the image of Christ, who is the image of God. 2 Corinthians 3.18, Romans 8.29, Colossians 3.10, all affirm that we are be being conformed to Christ's image as Christ is the image of God. Because Christ has saved us from our idolatry, we now resemble what we revere, not for our ruin, but for our restoration. And we see this principle at work in 2 Corinthians 3 and 4. And I know that our time has expired, but this is worth looking at. 2 Corinthians 3.18. It says... But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. And if you continue reading on into the next chapter, and we look at verses 3 and 4, even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving, so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Considering the Old Testament context of this passage that I just read, remember that Moses beheld the glory of the Lord as God hit him in the cleft of the rock and passed by. Moses beheld the glory of the Lord and his face was transformed by that encounter. He became like what he worshiped Jesus, as the image of God, 
reflects the glory of God back to his Father and outward into creation. And we now behold the glory of God as it's imaged to us in the face of Christ. Christ's face as the true humanity images the glory of God to us. And we who believe in Jesus are being restored as we behold Christ, as we revere him. We are being transformed into Christ's image as we behold the glory of God in the face of Christ. We become what we worship. And as we behold the glory of God emanating from the face of Christ, we are transformed. We become like him. That is the mechanism of sanctification. It's beholding God's glory in the face of Christ. And so take care what you behold, my friends. All of us spend a whole lot of time doing this, right? And this is changing you. You become what you worship, right? You become what you behold. We resemble what we revere, either for our ruin or for our restoration. Close with a few very quick considerations of how we image God. First, we image God in that we are relational. So God, let us, right? He says, let us make man in our image. While it may not be immediately apparent, I do think ultimately that has triune implications. We know that God is a triune God. There has eternally been a triune community, and God created us to be relational beings who relate to him and who relate to others for his glory. So as we seek to recapture and fulfill our function as the image of God, that will find its uh, fulfillment in relating to others as God would have us relate, right? Relating to him and to others. So we should consider in particular how we might image God to others in our relationships. Second, we image God in that we reflect him, right? We're said to be made in his image and in his likeness. So for instance, God says, be holy as I am holy. So we should represent his likeness. We should consider how we reflect him. And finally, we image God in that we represent him by exercising dominion. We are to govern ourselves and his world in accordance with his word. This has implications for personal sanctification, for discipleship and evangelism. It also has implications for things like politics. See, family camp messages last year, right? Where we talked about some of those things. But as God's image called to exercise dominion for his sake and as his representatives, God's word directs how we are to represent him in this world. In all these various ways, we are to image our creator. So as we come to a close, we come back to the importance of definitions. What is a human for? What is our telos? What is our calling? As the divine image, humanity is called to reflect God's glory in the world. Lentz puts it well when he said, the image bearer reflects God. The image bearer also illuminates the temple with that reflection. The mandate given to humans to multiply and fill creation in Genesis 126 is grounded in the prior claim that humans image their creator. It is double refraction in this regard, reflecting God and thereby illuminating creation with that reflection. We know that one day the whole cosmos will be God's temple. In the present, all of life for us as believers is to be an expression of worship. We should make no divide between sacred and secular, right? God has placed us in his creation as priests and kings to worship him in his sacred temple. We recognize that every sphere of life happens in the temple for us as all of our lives are lived quorum Deo, right? Before the face of of God. So may we then reflect the glory of God and by so doing illumine creation with the reflection of that glory. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word and that you have made us to be your image. You've made us in such a way that we can know you and relate to you, reflect your glory back to you and reflect your glory to one another. Lord, may we be careful as those who have been redeemed by Christ to image your glory 
to those around us. Lord, may we not behold our, our own image in other creatures who reflect our image back to us. May we not be obsessed with the mirror where we're looking at our own glory, but instead may we reflect your glory forth to those around us. God, we thank you for this time we have set aside this week, and I pray that as we go on to consider some of the implications of the truth that we've been made in your image, that you would give us wisdom and that we would order ourselves aright according to your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.